Hey everybody. Well, it's been a long weekend for me <clears throat> and for my family. So Ben is now married and I am now a father-in-law for the first time. That's kind of fun. So tonight we're going to talk about gold and hydrothermal fluids. <clears throat> it's a big topic and very important when it comes to being able to prospect for gold and find it. So I thought I'd kind of go back from, from uh, hitching up and getting married, uh, take a detour back to gold. It's time. So for this episode, we're going to kind of dive in a little bit, literally, into the Earth's surface and talk a little bit about what forms hydrothermal deposits and why they're so darn important to your understanding of gold and gold ores and where they can be found. Um, and the gold ores of obviously are the origin of gold placer. You know, so placer deposits come out of gold ores that get eroded, but only certain kinds of ores and certain kinds of deposits. And so we're going to talk a little bit about what makes a hydrothermal vent so interesting, a hydrothermal deposit and the cracking and all that stuff, and the hydrothermal fluids that basically fill up those cracks. And so let's talk about that for a minute. I'm going to check on you guys, make sure you're still with me tonight. I have not checked in for a little bit <clears throat> since last night. It went until late, <clears throat> oh, dark 30. So uh, they, the bride and groom are off on their honeymoon, and that's wonderful. Um, and thanks for all the cheers, everybody. I really appreciate that. I just thought it was kind of a fun venue, the, the uh, commemorative Air Force base. And, and uh, my son wanted so much, my son and his, and his bride wanted so much to have that uh, Mitchell, Mitchell Bomber II out there, the B-25. Um, that's a World War II relic that they have restored to fantastic condition. That's what these guys do, and they run off of donations. But they're a, a memorial for World War II. So what I did, uh, just for your information, is I published this little tidbit, which was a World War II memorial uh, <clears throat> about my father-in-law, who I, you, I talked to you guys about a little while ago. He just passed away. Uh, it turns out both the bride and the groom had tragedy strike this spring and they lost people they love very much father-in-law from world war ii history and her father from essentially from the afghanistan and uh, iraq wars and so it's pretty tough when you lose a loved one and it's uh you know also tough to to uh have it happen during circumstances that you know you just cannot control so but the fact is that we have so many men and women serving our country, and we really do appreciate that. So I just thought I'd pass that note on. Uh, Father-in-law's story was about a machine gun sight and some stuff. Maybe sometime I'll share it with you guys. But he, he had a, a miracle on Easter Sunday, uh, April 1st, 1945, in the Battle of the Bulge. So quite a, quite a story. Um, <clears throat> so for now, let's get back to our rocks and gold and hydrothermal deposits so i'm going to borrow some work here from wikipedia again <clears throat> it's kind of convenient to just kind of reference that it makes things go a little faster and what we're going to look at here is this uh you know arrangement of felsic dikes which are felsic simply means they're loaded in felspar which is a which is a a rock or mineral that's known as being alkali okay sodium calcium that kind of stuff uh, potassium, as opposed to uh, basaltic stuff, which is loaded with you know iron and, and uh, uh, mafic, uh, magnesioferric material, and that's known as acidic stuff. And so what happens is the balance between those two rock types is you know that's like you know geology or mineralogy 101. And what we're looking at here is a case where we have felsic magma, like a batholith underground that's in formation back a long time ago while it was still magma, molten, <clears throat> and this would be andesite, dacite, or granite. And the idea is that these hydrothermal fluids are peeling across, as you can see in this picture. Let me, let me amplify the picture here. Oh yeah, and tonight's uh, magic is brought to you by sourdoughminer.com 2020. So check it out. If you want to know more about water on the surface and how it moves gold and concentrates it, check out that link below. Gold and water flow, sourdoughminer.com 2020. So right now, what we're looking at on this picture <clears throat> are these hydrothermal deposits. Pardon my voice, it is toast. 
And, and the objective is these fluids, you know, what they don't show you here is they perk from the surface and then come down this way and then they eventually make their way next to the magma and boil off that material. And when they do, they also combine with the magma and the acids and sulfides and oxides and so forth. A lot of material is, you know, rich in metals like gold. And so it takes that and channels it upward through these fissures. And so as the material moves upward, it begins to leak out into permeable, permeable beds. And that's one of the other features that's necessary. And these permeable beds basically form a mass that is, uh, you know, shall we say, soaked in metallic concentrates, hydrothermal material, <coughs> such that when the water temperature drops or the pressure drops sufficiently and the material precipitates out, you end up with these ores. And the ores eventually, with erosion, let me paint a different color here. <coughs> so with erosion, this material along this edge used to go you know, across here and then eventually starts eroding downward and channels into areas where the ore shows up. And only till that happens <clears throat> will there be any formation of any kind of deposits other than the ore embedded in situ. Deposits such as placer load and things like that. Not placer load, placer deposits as opposed to load. These are all load deposits at this point until it starts getting this erosional characteristic where stuff starts tearing this material out because of river cuts and earthquakes and faulting and, you know, all the junk that happens to expose rocks. <coughs> Boy, I'm going to lose it tonight. Let's see. So, uh, I'm still checking to see that I've got everybody. Let me make sure. I'm pretty sure I do, but <clears throat> you know how it is. This is one of those weekends when I will go, oops. I don't want to do that. So, there we are as far as the video. And the audio is missing. Uh oh. There we go. Okay, so we got everybody, and Charles says hi. Hi, Charles. Good to see you, hear you, or read you. <laughs> Loud and clear. Uh, Brad Stevens there. Texas is seeing and hearing good. Great, Brad. And Larry Moore's there. All good. So let's just keep going. Okay, so, so as we look at these areas where these permeable beds get saturated with this, this uh, hydrothermal material that's basically circulating from the surface again i'm showing it in the red line circulates from the surface and comes back up to the top and goes into any crack it can find through these fissures and and uh, uh, faults uh, we talked about jointing any of that anything that can provide a, a gap where this stuff can permeate through it it will move remember this stuff is a liquid but in a kind of a viscous liquid but as it moves up higher and higher it becomes more steam and and more fluid <clears throat> and so it pushes a larger volume of that stuff up but again because of the physics the crystals of gold and silver and you know nickel and zinc etc lead start crystallizing out now remember these crystals can be metallic but in large amount because of the nature of what's happening here you've got a lot of sulfides and stuff so acid and so what's coming out is actually a chemical mix not a metal it's coming out as something that's saturated in the metal but in an ionic form all that means is the stuff won't bond together like a metal it'll bond together more like like uh, if it's copper it'll come out and look like uh, malachite or azurite you know really beautiful stones but they're not they don't look metallic they have to be you know reduced back to the metal by chemical and temperature and so that's kind of what we're doing here. So uh, I wanted to, you know, just show you that these guys are moving around up here. Um, <coughs> let me kind of outline all of these ore, bo uh, ore bodies. Um, kind of got big chunks of them. But again, all of it came up through this set of fissures. And this one, you know, they moved out this way and spread out. And then they'll move horizontally along these lines. So that's what the porosity is. And that's 
a different set of thrust faults. You know, that's the kind of thing that's going on here. You've got you got these vertical faults where things are moving across this way, and then you got thrust faults where they move horizontally, and, and the beds kind of crack in between. Kind of like what you see with fracking going on right now, where they crack that stuff across that that rock line, and, and uh, the material will move out of the rocks through that small pore and come out the other end <coughs> under the right conditions. Um, and so that's kind of the story here. The, the solutions that are rich will be channeling upwards along those major fracture lines. And so what you're looking for is something that gives you a, you know, a, a one, a measure of those fault lines, which you can use seismic information. Um, two, a measure of the ore bodies and that kind of mineralization, which you can use also seismic, but more likely electromagnetic information. So you're going to start using metal detectors and, and various things to look for the kind of hot rocks. You might look for density changes, uh, which would be in the form of a gravitometer. Some of these devices have been used through the years, towed by airplane or rolled across the ground. You know, just all depends. But there's all kinds of physics that goes into that measurement. Uh, physics that are you know dictated by, you know, looks like this one. Here we go. <coughs> Geophysical prospecting, right? And so what you're doing is. You're going through and using some characteristic of, of physics. Let's see if I can get this thing to show up right. Some characteristic of physics that will allow you to plot out the depth and the direction of these ore bodies. Once you know their size and direction, now you can start plotting out whether you want to do some diamond drilling or other you know, physical access to get some samples to determine if this is going to be an ore body worth exploiting way way beyond starting prospecting now going back to starting prospecting <coughs> when we have these ore bodies let's erase what we drew all over and just assume they're there and now we start having this erosional feature and and our good friend let's see i'm going to paint him yeah let's paint him yellow yeah, he's not going to show up let's paint him uh, blue okay gold is blue how about that and so your ore is full of gold in in blue form here and and so as it is formed it'll precipitate out where it darn well pleases you might get some material coming out in these geysers that are shown here and not doing a real good job of showing them but i'm trying to amplify what what was drawn in this diagram this is a diagram by the way uh, by uh, alex giovanni G giovi and uh, <clears throat> credit goes out to him about uh, doing this. And it was on a wiki page showing some material about geology and these ore bodies. Now, in this, there could be some concentrations, and typically is, of the sulfides and so forth that come out. And so you'll have these geysers and mud pits that might have material in them that would give you a pretty good idea what's down, down inside these pipes. And so based on that, you might, you know, consider, okay, that's another piece of information. Now, <coughs> when that stuff starts coming out, guess what? Downhill, downstream. So somewhere down in here, as erosion starts happening or precipitation of some of those sulfides, you're going to get some more deposits out here that might be more metallic, depending upon what reduced in the, in the, you know, stuff that got eroded or whether it's just going to form a big mass of highly enriched uh, chemical uh, sulfides, etc., and and therefore form a big ore body of some sort in the surface. But the idea is, either way, you're going to be detecting this material and finding out how rich it is with respect to gold, and whether or not it makes any sense to exploit. Hopefully, you know, if you're prospecting to start with, you know, you'll find some metallic gold that goes with it, so you'll have some placer deposit material in here to kind of sniff along in sense otherwise it's going to be a lot of sulfides and you know uh, colors and things like that and hot rocks and then you're going to be getting into more spectrometry and and uh, mineralogy and things like that to detect what you're looking at when you're looking at this ore that's sitting on the surface looks so pretty or ugly depends on which one it is <laughs> and whether it has value just as the ore like malachite you know as a, as a semi-precious gemstone so it's one of those things, or turquoise, you know, and, and, and that kind of thing. So here's, here's the deal. That fluid 
circulating from the surface goes down, comes along in contact with the felsic magma, or actually comes out of the felsic magma in some cases, joins with those fluids coming from the surface, <clears throat> and, and in the process goes up these shafts and moves out you know, along these you know, parallel planes, or not parallel, perpendicular planes, into the ore bodies that form and get eroded later. They might also pop out on the surface like we showed in the geysers, and that's an interesting possibility, but uh, the more interesting one for you is those ore bodies because that's typically where you'll find the most gold. Uh, anything on the surface, if it's contained in an oxide or some kind of mineralization, <clears throat> like a malachite, will probably get eroded and, and shoot downstream or get, you know, get chemically reactive and, you know, disappear on you before too long. So that's one of the things you kind of got to keep an eye out for. So that's tonight's subject, uh, hydrothermal vents and hydrothermal deposits and where gold goes, sponsored by 2020 here. Check it out. The 2020 report is still there and go look at it and let me know what you think. It'll help you get started on understanding where water drives gold in a placer deposit and where it comes from in a load. But mostly the, the idea there is placer gold and its concentration effects. So I will catch you tomorrow. Good prospecting and good night, everybody. Catch you then. Bye-bye.